Mr. Jairam Ramesh, Mr. Shashi Kumar, uh, my young friends from the Asian College of Journalism here, and other distinguished guests, I welcome you all to the public lecture, Warming Up to the Climate Change Challenge, organized by the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy in collaboration with the Asian College of Journalism. Uh, now I continue. Uh, it's my honor to introduce you to the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy, an independent, not-for-profit research organization supported by Kasturi and Sons Limited, publishers of the Hindu group of newspapers and magazines. The center was inaugurated by the President of India, Mr. Pranam Mukherjee, on January 31st, 2013. The founding vision of the center is to provide a credible and independent platform for research and analysis focusing on the ideas and institutions which form the bedrock of our parliamentary democracy. Uh, and as should, be, as should be evident from the name of the center, we cover both politics and policy with the understanding that the two are inseparably interlinked. The main streams of the Hindu center's activities are undertaking quality research, promoting dialogue and debate on the democratic values of pluralism and equi equity, holding track to round tables on internal conflicts, uh, and so on. The center has so far supported 15 public policy scholars through short-term fellowship. Uh, as part of the center's mandate, we've been holding public discussions on issues of contemporary importance, starting with a national consultation on the formation of Telangana in Hyderabad in September 2013. Uh, this was followed by panel discussions in Chennai on opinion polls, uh, domestic violence laws, and the right to education. In March 2014, just ahead of the general election, the center hosted a public lecture, The Science Behind Opinion Polls, del delivered by Rajiva L. Karandikar, director of the Chennai Mathematical Institute. Today's lecture by Mr. Ramesh is a continuation of center's public programs. We are happy to announce that Mr. Mr. Ramesh will be delivering a second lecture on the theme of climate change in Bangalore on November 10. In the coming months, the Hindu Center will be holding similar events focusing on issues of national importance. Thank you very much. I request Mr. Sashi Kumar to take the floor. But before that, you can follow us on Twitter uh, with the hashtag climate change or the Hindu center. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, Vidya. And uh, th the whole event is also being streamed live. I remember some years back, uh, we had uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh to deliver the convocation address of, uh, at the ACJ. It was held in a public hall outside. And uh, it was a much bigger hall than this. But what was common was it was again filled to capacity. In fact, it was overflowing. And uh, if you are a carping critic or cynic, if you are a congenital cynic, you could argue then that maybe because he was a minister and there was you know, a lot of people who came to be seen <laughs> for a minister's program. But now that he's not one and we still have an overflowing hall, I think it's testimony to the fact that Jairam Ramesh is taken seriously on subjects that uh, are dear to his heart and dear to, of concern to all of us, particularly on the issue of the climate. Jairam Ramesh is a member of the Rajya Sabha, as we all know, and um, he represents the state of Andhra Pradesh. A former union minister, he's held several portfolios in the union government, including rural development, drinking water and sanitation, environment and forests, commerce and power, and commerce as uh, standalone. Before taking up public office, he has been a technocrat, carrying out a number of administrative assignments. He was advisor to the finance minister, officer on special duty to the deputy chairman of the planning commission, to the prime minister, and in the planning commission. He's also been an additional economic advisor in the Ministry of Industry, and a consultant in the advisory board of energy cabinet secretariat. He graduated from the IIT Mumbai in mechanical engineering in 1975 and then did an MS in public policy from Carnegie Mellon University 
and he's also attended a graduate program in technology policy from MIT in the years 1977-78. Uh, yeah. He has written regular columns in the Telegraph, Times of India, Business Standard, and India Today, and also been a part of TV shows on business and current affairs in Doordarshan. He's also written for the Hindu. Now, some of his published works include Indo-US Relations, Globalizing India, Making Sense of Chindia. Besides, he's had a few forthcoming publications, notable among them being Ecology, Democracy and Growth, India's Maoist Challenge, and A New Deal for Land Acquisition. There are uh, far too many things that he's attempted and succeeded in doing for me to... Uh, to uh, uh, yeah, I, I must add here that he's also a senior visiting fellow of the Hindu uh, Center for Pu Politics and Public Policy. Uh, and, uh, but just to, just to give you a, a, a measure of the man, he played a key role in the design of legislation such as the Right to Information Act in 2005, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act of 2006, the Forest Rights Act of 2006, the National Food Security Act of 2013, and the Land Acquisition Act of 2013. He's also played a crucial role in placing environmental, sustainable development, and forest conservation issues on the national agenda. Internationally, he played a key leadership role in the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, 2009-10, and Climate Change Summit in Copenhagen in 2009, Cancun in 2010, which have, have been acknowledged by world leaders such as US President Barack Obama and the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is Jairam Ramesh for you. He's speaking to us today on warming up to the climate change challenge. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Shashi, for reminding me that I was a minister once upon a time. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Electoral debacles force politicians to search for avenues to keep themselves afloat. Mr. Ram was good enough to invite me to be a visiting fellow at the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy. Had I come here as a politician, I could have perhaps spoken extempore and got away with it. But as a visiting fellow, I have to appear a little more scholarly. And therefore, I do have a prepared text, which I will be which probably will be put on the website immediately after I have spoken. I speak to you this evening on a subject that has preoccupied me in my various ministerial capacities, but that continues to be of abiding interest and concern. Climate change has not just been part of human history, but has also shaped it decisively as well. It is well known, for example, that most species of large mammals were driven to extinction by climate-related factors some 12,000 years ago. Thereafter, civilizations both in West Asia and in the Indian subcontinent collapsed in very large measure due to environmental stress about 3,000 to 4,000 years ago. The period AD 1300 to 1850 is now referred to by historians as the Little Ice Age, a period in which Europe especially saw profound social and economic transformations, but a period that did not fail to leave its imprint in countries like India and China as well, especially in the 17th century. But the story has changed dramatically since then. Over the past six decades, Ever since a landmark paper first appeared in the journal called Tell Us in 1957, the concern has been on global warming and its impacts, some predictable and many others unpredictable. More than that, the concern has been with global warming not on account of some natural cyclical processes, but because of what are called anthropogenic factors, that is, because of human interventions. Today, there is a widespread consensus that an unprecedented buildup of greenhouse gases, 
like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and hydrofluorocarbons has caused global temperatures to rise, thereby increasing the probability of extreme weather-linked events like droughts and floods. Today's carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere at about 390 parts per million approximate to what prevailed 650,000 years ago and follow a very long period, over a thousand year period, when concentrations were stable at about 280 parts per million. Greenhouse gases are transparent to incoming shortwave solar radiation, but block long wave radiation from leaving the Earth's atmosphere. Because of this, more warming results than would be the case normally. Further, the climate effects of these emissions are widespread and relatively slow. Global warming is what economists would call a global negative externality affecting the global commons. It is in recognition of its profound international dimension that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC as it is often called, was adopted at Rio de Janeiro in June of 1992 and came into force in March of 1994. The UNFCCC is anchored in the principle of what is called common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. In pursuance of this principle, the Kyoto Protocol, which divided the world into Annex I countries that only that took on binding emission reduction targets and non-Annex I countries that only reported emissions of greenhouse gases was adopted in December 1997 and came into force from February 2005 with the first commitment period ending in 2012. In December 2012 at Doha, a second commitment period beginning January 1st, 2013 and ending December 31st, 2020 was agreed to. This protocol includes industrialized countries and countries making a transition to a market economy that collectively accounted for about two-thirds of all greenhouse gas emissions in 1990. Please mark this number because I will have occasion to come back to this number. The Annex I countries in the Kyoto Protocol, which took on binding emission target cuts, accounted for almost two-thirds of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world in the year 1990. The protocol got shaken up in the year 2000 from the refusal of the USA when President Bush refused to ratify it on the grounds that countries adding to the flow of emissions like China and India were exempt from any mitigation responsibilities. Canada too withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol in December 2012. By 2012, Countries that took on an emission cuts under the Kyoto Protocol covered only 20% of all world greenhouse gas emissions. So this is a protocol that was signed in 1997 on the basis of countries taking on emission cuts who accounted for two-thirds of the emissions in 1990 but today account for less than 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. In December 2007, the Bali Roadmap was adopted to enable the full, effective, and sustained implementation of the convention through what it called long-term cooperative action now, up to, and beyond 2012. Since then, there have been UN climate change conferences in Poznan in 2008, Copenhagen in 2009, Cancun in 2010, Durban in 2011, Doha in 2012, and Warsaw 2013. A lot of frequent fire miles for many of the negotiators. Next month, 
negotiators will meet in Lima. And the expectation is that there would be a new international agreement giving concrete shape to the Bali vision of long-term cooperative action at Paris in December 2015. India's position on climate, global climate change talks has been simple and can be summarized in the following three propositions. First, India didn't cause the problem of global warming, so it cannot be expected to bear the economic burden and the cost of solving it. Proposition number two, if India is expected to do something meaningful, then it should be provided with adequate finance and technology to accomplish the necessary transitions. And proposition number three, India's priority has necessarily to be rapid economic growth to alleviate poverty. If this involves pollution and deforestation, so be it. All countries have followed the grow now, pay later model, and there is no reason why India should be different. These are the three simple propositions that have governed India's approach to global climate change negotiations. These propositions have considerable logic, but they forget one fact, that India is most vulnerable to the vagaries of climate change and faces multiple vulnerabilities, both current and future. It is because of pressing domestic realities that India needs to change its traditional mindset and provide bold new intellectual and political leadership to global climate change talks. This can only take forward what the President of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee, said in his address to both houses of parliament on the 9th of June 2014, and I quote, the government will earnestly take up mitigation works to meet the challenges posed by climate change and will closely work with the global community in this regard, unquote. What are these domestic vulnerabilities? What are these pressing domestic vulnerabilities that are all too apparent, which dictate a change in India's traditional mindset on climate change? And I would like to refer to four fundamental vulnerabilities. First, India's economy is still heavily dependent on the July to September southwest monsoon, which accounts for about 70% of the rainfall that it gets annually. Agriculture may now account for less than 15% of GDP, but livelihoods and incomes of over 600 million Indians are still determined by the performance of the monsoon. 60% of India's gross cultivated area will continue to be rain fed even after all its irrigation potential is harnessed. Second, India has a 7,000 kilometer long coastline with over 150 million people threatened by an increase in mean sea levels, something which has now been established conclusively as a direct and immediate effect of climate change. Third, the health of the 10,000 odd Himalayan glaciers in India's territory has a bearing on water flow in the North Indian rivers. Although a few glaciers are actually advancing, an example of this is the Siachen Glacier, and a few glaciers are retreating at a decelerating rate, an example of this is the Gangotri Glacier, most Himalayan glaciers are actually in fact retreating. This has major implications for livelihoods and food security across the densely populated Gangetic Belt, home to close to half a billion people. And fourth, and to my mind, very important, which has not got the attention it deserves, most of India's natural resources, particularly coal and iron ore, which are needed to sustain rapid economic growth, are located in forest-rich areas of central and eastern India. Their extraction 
at the scale envisaged is bound to, a lo bound to lead to increased deforestation, is bound to lead to loss of valuable carbon sinks for which the creation of monoculture plantations are a poor substitute. So these are the four pressing reasons. The dependence on the monsoon, number one, the long coastline and the threat that is posed by increase in mean sea levels, third, the retreat of the majority of the Himalayan glaciers, and fourth, the fact that most of our coal and iron ore is in forest-rich areas, and the more coal and iron ore we use, the more we are going to deforest and add to the problem of global warming. Judged in a global context, India is definitely not a major contributor to the stock of global greenhouse gas emissions. Remember, there is a difference between stock and flow. India is not a contributor to the stock of global greenhouse gas emissions. Its share in the global stock of emissions since the Industrial Revolution, the relevant metric to measure the impact of greenhouse gas emissions on long-term climate change is negligible and even its contribution to annual flows is smaller than most countries which routinely call upon India to take action. In the past 20 years, with 16% of the world's population, India's share of global emissions has doubled from about 3% to 6%, but is still far lower than the shares of China, which is now 29%, the United States, which is 15%, the European Union, which is about 11%, and Russia, which is almost on par with India at about 5%. India has witnessed rapid economic growth over the past decade, when the average annual rate of GDP growth has been in the region of 7.5%. There is a consensus that this needs to accelerate even further to at least 8 to 9 percent per annum. It is only rapid economic growth that can help India meet the challenge posed by the entry of 8 to 9 million youth every year into the labor force. And the demographics are indeed extremely daunting. India's population is at present 1.24 billion, and estimates are that whatever we do, we are going to add another 400 million people by the middle of this century. We are 1.24 billion today. Our demographic karma is to add another 400 million people by the middle of the century, a third of the current population. China, and by that time, India will overtake China and become the world's most populous country. The needs of social and physical infrastructure for such an India can be fulfilled only through rapid economic growth that has to be inclusive as well so that the benefits accrue to larger and larger sections of society. But there is a third dimension to this growth. Growth has to be rapid, growth has to be inclusive, but there is a third dimension to this growth in addition to being rapid and inclusive, it has to be sustainable as well. So it's not just rapid growth, it's not just rapid inclusive growth, but it's rapid, inclusive and sustainable growth that we have to aim for so that our ability or the current generation's ability to enhance and meet its consumption needs is fulfilled without jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet theirs. Moreover, it has, to sustain, it has to be sustainable, and this is perhaps the single most important point I wish to convey this evening. It has to be sustainable because there is accumulating evidence within India that reveals that environmental issues of pollution and contamination, for instance, are becoming serious public health concerns particularly for the poorer sections of society. Environment in India is not a lifestyle issue. Environment in India is fundamentally a public health issue. And if we are serious about public health, we need to be serious about making our growth not just rapid and inclusive, 
but also sustainable. India certainly has a justified case when it argues that its absolute level of emissions are bound to increase in the next quarter of a century at least, but its per capita emissions will continue to be low. It has to be. Anything per capita is bound to be low in India because the denominator is 1.24 billion increasing by 10 to 12 million every year. So India has not just the lowest per capita consumption of soft drinks in the world, but it also has the lowest per capita emissions of greenhouse gases in the world. So there's no, no great surprise. Over the last two decades, India's per capita emissions have doubled to about 1.6 tons as compared to 7 tons in China, 17 tons in the United States, and about 13 tons in Russia. Although it must be admitted that right away that there are huge variations within the country itself. Studies done by institutions outside India on the global carbon budget approach <clears throat> for example, have revealed that whatever be the perspective on fair share, India has a long, long way to go before it uses up its legitimate quota. At Haile Gendam, in, July, in June of 2007, at the outreach summit of the G8, the former Indian Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, had publicly committed India to maintaining its per capita emissions at a level lower than the average per capita emissions of developed countries. Dr. Manmohan Singh's mandate to me in May 2009 on climate change negotiations when I took over as Minister for Environment and Forest was simple. India is not part of the problem, but make sure that we are part of the solution. That was because he realized that it is in India's enlightened political, economic and environmental self-interest to be so. And that was the mandate that was being executed at Copenhagen and Cancun, where India contributed significantly to the crafting of compromises and to the design of a way forward on contentious issues like MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification of mitigation actions, and contributed to new equity-linked formulations like equitable access to sustainable development, which broke many a logjam. What might a pragmatic agenda for India look like for the next few months in the run-up to the crucial 21st Conference of Parties at Paris? And I would like to highlight seven elements of a transformed Indian approach. First, whatever be its international stance, India must build up its own scientific capacity to measure, model, and monitor climate change. We must be part of the international scientific effort, but that engagement must come from a position of domestic strength. Four years ago, the Indian National Network on Climate Change Assessment, or INCA, INCCA, had been launched, but it now appears to be moribund. This network has about 120 institutions and over 250 scientists. It has already produced an updated inventory of greenhouse gas emissions and a 4 by 4 impact analysis for the year 2030. Four sectors, agriculture, water, natural ecosystems, and biodiversity and health, and four regions, Himalayan region, the Northeast, the coastal areas, and the Western Ghats. Inca also took on the responsibility for studying the issue of black carbon in detail, an issue of particular significance to India. India's extensive satellite capability must also be utilized for ecological monitoring. Second, India must agree to start discussions on the phase down, not the phase out, phase down of hydrochlorofluorocarbons or the HFCs under the Montreal Protocol. With China agreeing to do so last year, India has now become the only major country holding out on a conversation on HFCs. The joint statement issued on the 30th of September 2014 after the meeting between President Obama and Prime Minister Narendra Modi shows some welcome change in India's position. Actually, the paragraph in the joint statement is an exact replica of the statement signed on 
September 13, 2013, between Dr. Manmohan Singh and President Obama. In 2013, it was opposed by the current party in power, and I'm glad that the current party in power has seen fit to repeat that very same formulation, showing that in democracies where you stand depends on where you sit. <laughs> Despite the benefits accrued to the ozone layer, HFCs, which have high global warming potential, will contribute heavily to the buildup of greenhouse gases over the next three to four decades. Alternatives in the refrigeration and air conditioning industry especially that stop ozone depletion and do not exacerbate global warming are urgently needed. When ozone depletion was a big issue in the, big, in the late 80s and early 90s, the chlorofluorocarbons and the hydrochlorofluorocarbons were being replaced by the hydrofluorocarbons. The CFCs and the HCFCs were being replaced by the HFCs. And then scientists discovered that the HFCs, which stopped the depletion of the ozone layer, actually contributed to global warming. So now, a solution in one context has become a problem in a different context. And that is what I mean by saying that we need to address the is issue of HFCs. India does not have to go through the replacement of HCFCs by HFCs, and then replacement of HFCs uh, and through the replacement of HFCs and can access the multilateral fund under the Montreal Protocol to ease the transition. But more importantly, movement on this relatively low-hanging, potent fruit will give India a vantage point in international negotiations that could help shape future outcomes. Third, India has been implementing a national action plan on climate change since 2008 which is a portfolio of both mitigation and adaptation initiatives. In the international community, there is an impression that India is not willing to and is not taking requisite measures to address climate change. To counter this and to deepen domestic efforts to address climate change, India must pass comprehensive legislation in which initiatives such as a trading system for meeting energy efficiency targets mandatory fuel efficiency standards, improving quality of forest cover, establishment of concentration standards where they do not exist for emissions from power plants, like for sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen, are embedded. The confidence level of the global community in the seriousness, credibility, and continuity of India's actions will increase if such a domestic law is passed incorporating systems of monitoring as well. Legal framework to executive actions is what I am advocating. Fourth, India must push for a hybrid architecture for the 2015 agreement comprising national commitments reflecting the balance between the various pillars of addressing climate change like mitigation, adaptation, finance and technology and capacity building. In this hybrid model, certain elements can be bottom-up, like mitigation commitments, and certain elements can be top-down, like transparency provisions. A pure bottom-up approach will not meet environmental objectives, while a pure top-down approach will simply not be politically feasible, especially if we are to bring the United States particularly, and China into the mainstream of any agreement. Remember that between the US and China, they account for almost 45% of world greenhouse gas emissions. And an agreement without the US and China is really a meaningless agreement. India must support an option that gives the country flexibility and sets a global goal, which is reviewed periodically, and against which the commitments are made by individual countries and are analyzed from time to time. Fifth, India must take the lead, as it did at Copenhagen and Cancun, for designing a non-intrusive, non-punitive system of international reporting and verification, much along the lines of the international consultations and analysis for countries like China and India, contained in the Copenhagen Declaration, an international assessment and review contained in the Cancun Agreement for countries like the USA and other developed nations. Such a system 
will work on the basis of technical reports submitted by the countries themselves, unlike as in the case of the IMF and the WTO consultations, where the organizations do the technical analysis. Here, the countries would do the technical analysis and submit it to an international body like the UNFCCC. All countries will be subject to this international system of reporting, monitoring, and verification. Sixth, India must revisit and rework its articulation of equity and differentiation. Differentiation is definitely needed to reflect equity considerations in the architecture of any agreement. But while a new agreement should not become an excuse to wipe out past obligations, it must also not become an opportunity to reaffirm stratifications of the past. The 1992 criteria of differentiation may no longer be valid, and India must lead the way to determine the criteria for differentiation in 2014. A better and more realistic metric of equity and differentiation is required. At the same time, it is necessary to introduce the concept of graduation so that countries take on increasing responsibilities as they move up the equity metric ladder. India must continue to insist on differentiation, but it must be a realistic differentiation that is acceptable across the board. A graduation approach can only benefit India, which is still a low middle income country, and its commitments will only grow as its per capita income increases. India must also seriously consider supporting innovative proposals on the equity issue, such as the Africa Group's equity reference framework that advance the cause of equity in a practical way for which India has been a consistent champion. Finally, India must begin to shift demonstrably to the trajectory of low carbon growth by making the appropriate investment and technology choices in different sectors of the economy. The report prepared by an expert group of the Planning Commission before it was wound up and made public in April 2014 provides many options. This expert group concluded that if a comprehensive valuation of benefits is done, even with lower GDP, the low carbon growth strategy is worth pursuing. In any case, the reduction in the average annual GDP growth rate by the expert group's own reckoning by the use of low carbon strategy is just 0.1 to 0.15 percentage points per year. In other words, if you're growing at 8% per year, and if you shift to a low carbon growth strategy, you won't grow at 8%, you will grow at 7.85 or 7.9%. That is the difference between a high carbon growth strategy and a low carbon strategy. A low carbon strategy, contrary to public perception, contrary to what most people believe, depresses the GDP growth only by 0.1 to 0.15 percentage points. So instead of growing at 8, you grow at 7.9. In any case, the reduction in the average annual GDP growth by the expert group's own reckoning is just as I said, 0.1 to 0.15 percentage points. The additional investment required is about 1.5% of GDP. And India has the capacity to meet the investment requirements largely on its own, an argument that should get added weight because of the core benefits involved in a low carbon growth strategy. And the biggest core benefit lies in the domain of public health. Friends, in global negotiations, both substance and style count. India's substance has to be pragmatic, and its style has to be one of engagement. It is in India's own interest that the Paris Conference yields something meaningful as a starter. Paris will not yield the magic bullet, but can initiate an iterative process that begins to make a difference to global warming. India must view the era of the green economy not as a threat to its development plans. Instead, it must be viewed as an opportunity to build and demonstrate technological capability 
to the world. Thank you. So there you have the presentation. And now the theme, the subject, the presentation is open for discussion. Just some ground rules. Uh, may I request each of you who is raising a question to identify yourself so we know who is asking the question. Do try and restrict yourself to one question per person. One question per person, but we get as diverse uh, representation as possible. Uh, three, do keep it as a question and as short as possible. Um, and uh, there we are. So, so And uh, yes, we'll start with uh, somebody's. Just because you're sitting on the aisle, you get preference, right? <laughs> Good evening, sir. I'm Meghnad. Uh, I'm a student at the ACJ. Uh, sir, while we express discontent on the BJP government and Prakash Javdekar changing the definitions of forests and violet and inviolate areas to suit corporate lobbies, assume, assumably, uh, we can also not forget how Jayanti Natarajan was removed from the Environment Ministry and replaced by Virapa Moili in what prima facie seemed a conflict of corporate and environmental interests. While the policy plans you have laid forth may be well intended for the environment, is there a scope for political will to introduce action on the same? Thank you. Well, you know, I'm not here as a politician, okay? I'm not gonna make any, I'm not gonna make any political comments. But I do want to say that I'm deeply concerned. I'm deeply pessimistic on the prospects of any positive thinking on environment. Because right now, the environment is one of growth triumphalism, growth at all costs. Uh, and the fact that an expert committee was constituted to review all environmental laws within two months, I mean laws that have been on the statute books for 40 years. People forget in this country that the Environment Protection Act came in 1986 after the worst industrial disaster that has overtaken humanity, namely Bhopal. So every piece of legislation, whether it's the Forest Conservation Act, whether it's the Environment Protection Act, whether it's the Clean Water Act, whether it's the Clean Air Act, has a certain historical context to it. And within two months, this group of five wise men is going to rewrite these laws, uh, you know, makes me very worried. So I, frankly, as an individual, uh, I feel that the balance has now shifted. Uh, you know, this so-called conflict between growth and environment, uh, it, there's really no conflict in my view. Uh, I think it's a trade-off. There are certain cases where the growth objective takes precedence. There will be certain instances and circumstances where you will have to make a conscious choice in favor of environmental issues. Uh, but right now, I think the overall environment does seem to be one of relaxation of the laws and regulations. And I can only hope that when these amendments come back to Parliament, that Parliament will take a more enlightened view and would not uh, allow these changes to happen without a proper debate. But these are laws. What can be done through executive action will be done through executive action. But changes in the laws will require the government to come back to Parliament. So I. Um, uh, I think um, we are. This going to be a huge uphill struggle ahead of, and uh, the. That's why I see. I think that it's important to redefine the parameters of the environment growth debate. As long as it is seen as environment versus growth, growth will always win. Okay, uh, but what I have been advocating with singular lack of success, I must admit, uh, last couple of years, is that the environment issue is not an environment issue, it's a public health issue, you know. Uh, issues of air pollution, issues of water pollution, issues of chemical contamination, these are not growth related issues, these are issues of public health, these are issues of livelihoods, you know. Uh, and if, if you look at environmental issues as livelihood issues, health issues, then you will not see the conflict with growth. But if you position and so then I'm afraid the debate is not going to be won. My name is P.R. Ayer. I am a retired engineer from National Thermal Power Corporation. 
No, the energy needs of India seem to be wholly dependent or largely dependent on coal. And coal reserves, as you say, are all located in the <clears throat> forest areas. There is going to be a large-scale deforestation, and coal has to be excavated for power. Power is the need for growth. I really see that this kind of a cycle is going to degrade the environment, and if environment is the most important concern, as against growth, there is going to be a conflict. I do not know if laws in this country can take care of this. And uh, the international requirement uh, to mitigate or have a sustainable energy, it doesn't look to be coming. The only solution, uh, without being a problem, I would like to also to add a solution to it. The only solution that appears to me is uh, renewable energy. But this renew renewable energy is getting into another uh, problem of uh, cost. How do we look at this, sir? Thank you. Actually, my talk in Bangalore is going to be exclusively on energy and climate change. You have raised a very fundamental issue. Uh, energy is the, at the heart of the climate change debate. 50% uh, of all greenhouse gas emissions in India come from our power sector. You know? So what do we do? What sort of an energy strategy do we have? Uh, and you're absolutely right that when you look at the technological reality for the next 10 to 15 years, there doesn't seem to be an alternative to coal. Coal still accounts for 65% of all the electricity that we generate comes from coal. Uh, we have our nuclear capacity has not been able to increase uh, beyond 3.5%. It's been static at about 3.5%. So our nuclear portfolio has not increased. Our hydro portfolio is about 20%. But as you know, Big hydro projects uh, have their own uh, consequences, submergence, seismicity, uh, interstate disputes, uh, long need, uh, a lot of, lot of our potential is in Arunachal Pradesh, it has to be, the power has to be generated there and transported over long distances. Uh, and you're right, renewables don't seem to be uh, cost effective at, at in today's context. So, I mean, prima facie, Prima facie, it does appear that we are in a you know, sort of situation where we have no option. I think we need to think completely differently now, frankly. And I have always been saying, for example, uh, that India should be the world leader in renewables. I've been saying this for the last 15 years. And let me give you an example of what I mean. Today, the country that has no business being the world leader in, renew in solar energy is the world leader. Germany, in which there is no sun for six months in a year, is generating 37,000 megawatts. 37,000 megawatts from solar energy. And India is barely crossing 2,500. Barely crossing 2,500. What have the Germans done? In a country of 80 million people in Germany, there are 6 million energy producers. You know, I went to Germany recently. And an Indian who lives in Germany came to receive me at the airport. So I sat with him in the car and we were going and I asked him, Arnie, he's half German, half Indian, I said, how much do you pay for electricity here? So he says, I don't pay anything for electricity. I said, you've taken your Indian habits back to Germany. <laughs> So he said, no. He said, I am an energy producer. I generate electricity. You know, I've got solar rooftop. I've got a windmill in my garden. And the German system is a feed-in tariff system. For 20 years, you're guaranteed a return. By law, the utility has to buy the power at whatever time it is generated. And the net result today is that Germany, 30% of Germany's electricity supply, not capacity, Supply comes from renewables. So I think you know India must now rethink its strategy on renewables. We must do to renewable energy what has happened for the mobile phones. Costs were driven down, ownership patterns changed. You know everybody now has got a little mobile phone. That's what we need to think in renewables. And maybe, sorry? 
Well, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. No two Gs. <laughs> and I think that is one aspect of India's energy situation that can help. But in the next 10 years, there is no alternative to coal. We have to depend on coal. But we can make the burning of coal cleaner. Clean coal is not, you know, it's an oxymoron, it's a contradiction in terms. Coal can never be clean, but it can be only cleaner. We can have cleaner coal, we can have higher efficiency in coal, and you can at least protect some of the virgin forest areas where coal is found. I mean, at least that trade off you can make. So it's a difficult choice. It's a difficult choice. And uh, I must say, because I see some environmentalist friends of mine sitting in the audience, and I'm sure they'll ask me this question, so I'll preempt them. You know, these environmentalists are strange species. You know, they, they, are, they are for, they want low greenhouse gas emissions, they want clean, they want clean technology for energy, but they're all anti-nuclear. The, the one energy source which does not put out CO2 into the atmosphere, the one uh, energy source that is non-polluting is a unacceptable option as far as the environmental community is concerned. So, you know, they are against hydro, they are against nuclear, they are against coal. So, what are they for? So, we, we have to make choices, difficult choices. Next 10 years, cleaner coal, a little more nuclear, and certainly a huge expansion in renewables is the only way forward for India. There are quite a few hands, but before that, there's a question which has been written in by N. Ram. Uh, I request Jai Ram to tackle it. Because you, because you, because you wrote it in. Novel method of. <laughs> well, Mr. Ram says your emphasis on the public health dimension in this context seems to connect in some way to Indira Gandhi's famous and apparently intriguing statement. Whoever wrote that line for her, that poverty is the greatest polluter. Does this make sense? First of all, you know, I must say that leaders, statements attributed to many leaders, the best statements have never been made by those leaders. Uh, Gandhiji is supposed to have said that the world has enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. And I called Gopal Gandhi and I said, when did Gandhiji make this statement? So Gopal said, the more dramatic MKG statement, take it for granted that he never made that statement. And he had never made that statement. Similarly, Indira Gandhi, she is supposed to have said in 1972 in Stockholm, poverty is the greatest pollutant. Actually, guess what, Mr. Ram? She never said that. Uh, what she said, what she said, and in fact, I have quoted that in the article in the Hindu just three days ago, two days ago. What she said was a very nuanced thing. She said, are not poverty and need the greatest polluters? And what she was trying to say was that conservation and growth should not be seen in conflict with each other. That conservation is important in its own right. But that problems of poverty also cause problems on the environment. So it's not just, you know, become affluent without effluent. I mean, that basically, that's what she was trying to argue. Today, I think, frankly, the missing dimension in the environment debate is the public health debate. And one way of getting a larger political buy-in to environmental issues is to, I mean, this is the world we live in a world of packaging, right? In the era of packaging, uh, where individuals are packaged, and now trying to package an issue. And if you package the environment issue as an issue of preservation of nature, preservation of wilderness, you're not going to get far. But if you package the environment issue, which it really is, as an issue which affects the public health of people, I think you will go a great distance. And today, we have adequate information on the adverse effects of public health. 
we have uh, we have seen for example uh, places like bhatinda in punjab which have emerged as major centers of cancer because of chemical contamination uh, my friend jaraman is here uh, mercury uh, he has been fighting this battle on mercury contamination uh, in uh, kodaikanal but i can say that in singroli uh, which is perhaps the second largest concentration of mercury uh, pollution in india already you are beginning to see uh, the entry of mercury pollution into the uh, into the human food chain and beginning to see long term effects so the public health is the neglected dimension of the environment debate and if we are able to demonstrate which i think we can that it's not only you know the preserving the rivers or preserving mountains or preserving forests that are important ultimately people that is going to be affected then i think maybe it a political constituency for environment today you need a political constituency for the environment i'm david i run a, a consulting firm um business consulting firm i was wondering if you are uh, thinking from inside the box because we speak like our uh, grandfathers created the earth a few years back and we are trying to preserve it uh, a thousand years of history is nothing we we just here for a fleeting 3 seconds in a 24 hour uh, time scale and we just uh, biding our time uh, until the next meteor strikes or the solar sun flares up so i'm just wondering do you really believe that we can make a difference and preserve things on earth i mean it just needs one itch uh, for the, for the earth to scratch and we we lose to 230000 people in a tsunami so what are you talking about well you know it's a very important question you've raised because the general belief is that human beings can adapt to anything but why worry about global warming we adapted to global cooling we'll adapt to global warming right i mean that's the general belief uh, we have floods i mean we don't we don't see the kashmir floods as an example of an extreme event that is being caused by climate change we do not see the floods that devastated uttarakhand last year uh, as an example of a, a natural calamity that arose out of environmental stress so our approach is uh, disaster strikes we adapt you know uh, and then we move on uh, the question really is is the cost of action lower or higher than the cost of inaction uh, most as of now the world community as i have explained to you for the last 15 years we have been debating this issue but we are no closer to clinching it now than what we were 15 years ago but we have had drought we have had flood we have had natural disasters we have had tsunami but nothing seems to nothing seems to move us into a solution so it's these are difficult issues you know uh, and everybody india is waiting for china to move china is waiting for the us to move the us is waiting for china to move and you know everybody else is waiting for everybody else to move and nothing happens so who has to take the first step i what i have been saying for the last couple of years and i have not been a, a, a majority view that india must try to make a difference india must show a different view and why should india show a different view i have given you some reasons and the most important reason is that india is a late comer right we we don't have to repeat the mistakes of the us we don't have to repeat the mistakes of china we don't have to grow for 8% for the next 20 years and then clean up 20 years from now so we can make a difference we sh we can show a different model but question is are we prepared to show the different model i think that's the, the political leadership that is required yes if you just keep your hands up a little i'll note them all right good evening sir uh, my name is neil philip i mean i is aspirant uh, my question is like uh, normally when we come to climate change it's always uh, a negative feeling like i believe that uh, hope is a bigger feeling than fear like when we come to climate change it's always like uh, if you like if the climate goes i mean if you do em emit co2 the uh, weather or it gets hotter and we suffer it's always in the negative the pessimistic side what i uh, seriously want to ask us like if we give people hope 
it's like if you do this there's a possibility of earth cooling down so you, we are giving hope to people rather than fearing or giving installation installing fear in them if can't we give them hope so that everybody tries to bring down uh, in their own way bring down emission caught in a situation as who is going to take the first step you know who is going to take the first step uh, as i said you know everybody is waiting for everybody else uh, and in 1992 uh, let me give you some in 1992 when the, the un fccc was formulated and adopted the world was different than in 2014 In 1992 China accounted only for 11% of world house greenhouse gas emissions nobody bothered about China it would today China is the world leader in greenhouse gas emissions 29% and India has gone from 3 to 6 as i mentioned to you so you know uh, the world has changed the world has moved on but i must say one thing that the problem of climate change has been caused by economic prosperity the more we have become more prosperous and in the process of becoming more prosperous we have created this problem of global warming so global warming is not a problem of poverty global warming is a problem of increasing prosperity the challenge is how do we keep on this path of increasing prosperity or is it possible to move on the path of increasing prosperity without exacerbating the problem of climate change because as of now the prognostications are that in the 20 by the year 2100 the world temperature will go up by another 3 to 4 degrees or 5 degrees celsius yeah but you know we have to think in terms of, these are the effects no these are the effects but what i am saying is there are also positive things there are also positive things better health longer life expectancy these are the positive things that come the co benefits that come from a low carbon economy the preservation of forests so i think the co benefits from a low carbon growth and not just the global warming effects of low carbon growth those have to be stressed much more this is with reference to the link between low carbon growth and the cdm what has been india's track record dealing with the cdm money why is india's access to cdm money is so low why are we talking about low carbon when we are not able to access our fair share in the cdm structure and who are the people from the government side who negotiate on the cdm and how is the tenth cdm money worked out see india has had an ambivalent cdm for those of you who don't know yeah. stands for clean development mechanism and it's in simple english it means that the western countries can continue to pollute if they buy the rights to pollution by investing in china so you build a little forest here you invest in a solar plant here you put a hydro project here that gives you brownie points you know it gives you earn you earn some right and that right you pollute that is why cdm was actually opposed india was fundamentally opposed to the cdm because what what the essence of the cdm is you can continue what you are doing provided you do play the good samaritan uh, in the developing world so india's approach has always been ambivalent by the way but the chinese have not don't have this ambivalence you know because china does not approach any issue from you know you know india's approach to any issue internationally is on moral consideration we are moralistic people you know the chinese are not bothered about morality they say how much money are we going to get so 90% of all cdm money is going to china the that's a simple answer to your question they all gone to china the chinese have just and now in fact when i was the minister in one meeting i said cdm should be recalled it should be renamed it should be called china development mechanism <laughs> not clean development mechanism with all all the wind power plants all the solar plants you know to get our chaps thinking it took some time but by that time now the cdm as you know the cdm the, if there is a kyoto protocol you have cdm if there is no kyoto protocol there is no cdm kyoto protocol has died in 2012 now there is a second commitment period 
But the number of countries in the Kyoto Protocol, remember, the Kyoto Protocol, when it was done, two-thirds of all emissions were in the Kyoto Protocol, now less than 20%. So the, the kitty of the CDM also has shrunk. Hello, I'm Vanya from Hindu Center. Uh, I was wondering, so you mentioned a little bit about who is sort of responsible for, like, how we should view um, climate change in terms of responsibility. Like, is it at an individual level? Is it at a government level? Is it corporate interests? But one of the things I was interested in is uh, this current uh, government. Um, Modi has come up with this thing lately where he's saying that everyone should take some sort of interest in cleaning, and uh, which is related to pollution, right? So I was wondering if uh, sort of what you think about these initiatives to say a slum-free city or you know keep keeping things clean on the surface and say the Sabarmati Riverfront project, that development project, right? Or the Ganga, what, what he wants to do in the Ganga. Um, you know, what is it, is, is that a sustainable model uh, or not? I can only laugh at what's happening because uh, two, and a half years, two and a half years ago, when I first said that India needs more toilets than temples, uh, the, v the, the RSS and VHP guys came outside my house and left bottles of urine as a mark of protest. Uh, and wherever I went for six months, uh, the Kadas, you know, chased me saying that, you know, I'm being disrespectful of faith and so on. So I'm, I'm happy that, uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister then said, Shochalai pehle devalai baad mein, which is, you know, saying toilets first and temples later. So it's good that, you know, at least now uh, there is a national recognition at the highest level that we need to do something about open defecation. And, you know, that open defecation is a national curse. I mean, it's, it's a fact. And is it going to happen in the next two to three years? It's going to be challenging. It's not, it's not going to be easy. 60% of open defecation in this country is going to be a huge challenge. But I think we need to move in this direction. Environmental sanitation is very important. It, it affects public health. It affects nutrition. I mean, there is now evidence to show that chronic malnutrition is because of poor environmental sanitation practices. So I, I would, I'm all for uh, national efforts. But you know, these must go beyond gimmicks. You know, they, they, it, it, you must. Uh, make this, uh, it has to be a people's movement, it has to be a national movement, uh, and each one of us really has to take on the responsibility. And uh, if the political, if there is a political will, I'm sure that, you know, we, we will move along these lines. Our rivers, for example, you, you mentioned the Ganga, for example. I mean, look, it's 80% it's of the pollution in the Ganga comes from the discharge of untreated sewage into the Ganga. It's not from industrial pollution. You can control tanneries and paper mills and uh, you know sugar plants and so on. But what do you do when 80% of the pollution of the Ganga comes from human sewage, which is untreated? You know, so you've got major investments that you have to make in sewage treatment. Uh, and you have to ensure that this does not get into the river without treatment. And this is not just true in the Ganga, it's true of most rivers and water bodies in the country. Just we seen some uh, macro policies, statistics and data about in India and status and our country's stance and status. I don't have, I don't own any industry to implement renewable energy. As an individual, how could play the role to meet a climate change challenge? Be able to understand? I agree. I don't, yeah. What can an individual do yeah, individual. to affect climate change? I agree yeah. with you. I mean, ultimately, the macro is the sum of the micros. You know, what do what individuals do uh, will ultimately add to the sum and sum total of. But you know, the problem with individual action is that whatever action we do, we think that it will not make any difference whatsoever. So therefore, we don't do that action. But if collectively, if collectively, uh, we decide on a particular course of action, then I think people, uh, it does begin to make a difference. Um, for example, I'll give you one simple example. Public transport versus private transport. 
if you have if peop more people use public transport than private transport it does begin to make a difference to climate change and global warming in the design of buildings the way you design your buildings individual these are all individual choices not government choices individual choices the way we design our buildings if we are able to design our buildings in such a manner that you reduce the energy load that contributes to lessening the load on global warming so it is individual actions ultimately but you know without uh, without mandates without governments actually making these choices you are not going to get individual actions individual companies can decide to reduce the level of pollution but your question is what do you as an individual do what do you as an individual do so what you do in terms of public transport what you do in terms of energy supply I mean, one thing you can do immediately when you go home today if you have a compact fluorescent lamp in your house just take out that cfl and throw it out yeah. and use an led because it made difference if all of us use leds it makes a huge difference to electricity supply uh, to the demand for energy so you know a lot of these things individually you may think that you're not making a difference but actually an individual action taken collectively does begin to make a difference um i'm nandini dubey from the hindu center for politics and public policy and my question is that uh, we are looking forward to the thermal power and uh, the nuclear power in terms of the in energy energy crisis we are facing but uh, as we all know that india has the second largest uh, population in the world just next to china so this population every morning releases the second largest quantity of human waste which is true enough and why can't why can't we utilize that waste uh, for generation of electricity instead of looking at uh, nuclear power and thermal power like why are not we not looking forward to it oh uh, a valid point uh, for many years for 50 60 years we have tried to bring about a biogas revolution in this country uh, but we have not been very successful uh you know biogas plants have been tried in different parts of the country it is not not just human waste but predominantly based on cattle way cattle dung uh but they have not been very very successful for a number of social reasons you know uh we, we can discuss that separately uh but the general proposition that you are making that waste can be converted into energy is true Uh, and increasingly that is becoming a source of energy generation in many parts of the world you know many parts of the world uh, the recycling of waste uh, uh, is leading for example now waste water recycling the use of recycled water uh, you know uh, geneva for example uh, geneva's water supply if I, after i tell you uh, uh, don't say that you will never go to geneva but uh, geneva's water supply is sewage water recycled seven times it's you know uh, people don't we go to geneva everybody wants to go to geneva right that's where all the bank accounts are so that's <laughs> everybody wants to go to geneva but geneva's water is recycled water seven times you know so there are solutions there are solutions and increasingly uh, the use of waste to extract energy particularly for the urban areas is going to be very very significant i don't know whether in chennai there are any waste to energy plants but i know in delhi there are three plants that are coming up which are actually generating electricity from waste you know uh, sir uh, my name is ganesh i am a lecturer in media my question is that uh, there are issues like uh, acid rain which is plaguing the developed countries but in india we have the under development problem that is we have the problems of under development and we have under developed pollution uh, but what what could be the uh, reason why we are not able to uh, tackle issues like uh, ga greenhouse gases and all that see we have only under developed problem and uh, i had been to china and china there are lesser cars and more what is the question can you, can you make it short yeah. raise the question okay yeah. 
So the, my question is that when we have underdevelopment problem, why do we have to concern ourselves with uh, issues like this? Because we want economic development. Okay. Okay. Economic development is important, but do you think this is tied up with the economic development? What way we can solve it effectively? Because we are not going to have acid rain in this country anymore. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, you'll be surprised to know that acid rain will soon become a huge issue in India. India is the second largest emitter of sulfur dioxide now in the world. Second largest. We tend to think that these are problems of the rich countries. They are no longer problems of the rich countries. Uh, take China. You mentioned China. Why has China changed its attitude on the environment in the last five to ten years? Why? Most important reason is because people in China are beginning to demand a better quality of air, better quality of water, better quality of food, free of chemical contamination, that even a Chinese Communist Party has to admit that environment is not a bourgeois issue. It's an issue that affects the proletariat. So, you know, the, I, please disabuse yourself of this notion that India is a poor country and all we need is fast economic growth. Let's forget about everything. I mean, it's an important, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a viewpoint which I share, which I respect. I'm not necessarily share. That you know, for the next 20 years, let's just forget about everything. Let's just have, you know, more energy, more growth, more roads, more power plants, and we'll worry about the environment 20 years later. The whole point is that model is not a viable model for India because of the sheer demographics, number one. It's not a viable model of India because of the public health impacts that it is going to have in the, in the next 20 years. And thirdly, it's not going to be viable internationally. It's simply not going to be viable. Uh, hi, I'm Vasundra from the Hindu Center. And uh, my question is actually related to the framing of the debate, the reframing of the debate that you want. So one of the things that emerged from your talk today is this idea that undergirds your lecture, that it is difficult to try to identify stakeholders and then make them bond together in this environmental debate. And basically the argument being that, you know, how do you get people together that say saving the environment is a good thing? So you're identifying the state as a stakeholder in this through a public health discourse. Now I was wondering, have you thought about looking at the environmental challenge as something that also severely impacts state capacity and internal security? Because uh, the Kashmir floods, and we've had a lot of natural disasters over the last few years, and I was in Kashmir last month when the flood happened, and there was, you know, the state was just not functioning at all, and it, the civilian administration had collapsed. And uh, the same thing happened to a limited extent in Uttaranchal, with some good things coming out of Orissa. But also, people that get displaced through environmental disasters and also through development projects are also very recruitable into different types of militia. And uh, a lot of these disasters are occurring in the fringes of the country. So I was wondering if there's some way to generate a state capacity sort of argument to try and involve the state as a more serious stakeholder uh, in this debate. Taking it now to the next level. You know, I'm really worried about now the basic fundamental level uh, of livelihoods and of, you know, uh, where we're basically talking of livelihood and public health. You have now taken it to the next level of security. I mean, you know, what it does uh, for security. And surely uh, what you say is absolutely right, you know. Uh, the uh, issues of environment uh, in places like the Northeast, uh, in, pla in the hilly areas of the Himalayas, have very serious security repercussions. I mean, it's. N I mean, I can't disagree with you uh, that you know we, we must look. These are. Um, I mean, for example, it's very well known that uh, conflicts in the northeast, uh, which are often loosely called ethnic conflicts, are actually conflicts on access to land, uh, access to water. I mean, these are all. Uh, look at um, uh, look at the whole Maoist insurgency in central India. Uh, that's a separate issue altogether. Uh, but it's very interesting. If you look at the map uh, of India, if you plot the mineral wealth of India, if you plot the forest wealth of India, uh, if you plot the tribal populations of India, and if you plot the most affected areas, you almost get a one-to-one -one match. That the forest-rich areas, the mineral-rich areas are precisely the areas which are also Maoist, 
insurgency linked. So we have uh, the way we manage our forests uh, has in large part fueled uh, the Maoist insurgency. You know, we, we still look upon the tribals as enemies of the forest. We still have the Indian Forest Act of 1927, uh, which you, you will have a case registered against a tribal who is going to collect fuel, wood or fodder from the forest area. So the security dimension, internal security and external security, both are very important when it comes to ecological issues. Very happy to hear you. I heard you in Copenhagen also, where I participated. Uh, yes. <laughs> but now, the, I mean, this spe speech, I, I would say, we enjoyed it. I want to say, myself and Ram, we co-founded Exnora 25 years ago. It's the largest people's movement. <laughs> and uh, there's a very big one lakh that is on branches are there. I want to mostly address the audience. Uh, I want to say, stop preaching. St yeah, yeah, okay. well, truth only. We ought to say, because people are feeling gloomy, because I come, I live in a flat, I got 2,000 plants all growing inside, Hindu extensively covered it. So I want to say, stop preaching, start doing, the world will be less by one scoundrel, at least you, that's all. <laughs> and uh, I want to say only three quick one bullet point examples. One example is, we are created, children are difficult, we have answers, but how to take it to the politician? Uh, children are easing on the road. We create toilet, T-O-Y-L-E-T, -E where we had rocking chair, or sort of people all join. Then, for men who were answering call, we created joylet. You know, the point is that 2,000 people, only three cubicles, all the answer. So we gave a bench, newspaper, music. We said, but you'll not all of you carry the newspaper inside. Lastly, I want to say one example. We created toilets, I mean, our organization with the, uh, what you call pay, you know, we have pay and use and public toilet. We created use and receive toilet. If you go 30 days, we give you 10 rupees. You, you can ask me how. The wastewater is treated, is sent for articulture, gas waste trapped goes to canteen, and the solid waste becomes mineral. I'm giving some good examples. And all our members, we have unlike, unlike there is no branches, as you said, we have a terrace farm. We get at least 10 days, I have a terrace farm. 10 days vegetables we grow. We do street farming, city farming and all. That's all I want to share Thank because you. it's all been happening. Only thing we are the south end of India. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, sir, uh, and it was very ple uh, my pleasure to hear from you. I am a social work trainee from Madras School of Social Work. Uh, I have a question. Actually, we what we talk today is basically about the mainstreamers who do all the uh, ill to the environment as such. Uh, we were talking uh, about uh, the economic activities that flourish with the ills, ill effects that we cause to the environment. Uh, my question is regarding the tribal uh, people who we found in the fo we, who we find in the forest, and it was very interesting to note that the environmental ill effects that you told, you correlated it uh, with uh, um, with public health. And when I read about the uh, Dalits and the tribals one time, I found that most of the women are getting affected due to environmental problems. That is, if deforestation happens, they have to work long miles uh, to get the timber. Or if water is not there, they have to walk more than uh, like five kilometers a day to and fro to get the water. So uh, apart from these, what all are the environmental ill effects that cause uh, uh, a bad effect on the tribals as such? I would like to have uh, you know your say on that, sir. I think you've raised a very important question on uh, how is environment, how are environmental, fa ecological factors really affecting uh, the health of tribal populations? And there is no, there is no question. And we have ample evidence to show, for example, now that the way, as I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, our forest, the way we manage our forests, uh, has had a major effect uh, on livelihood security of the tribal population. Uh, and we have not uh, we have not made the tribals partners in forest regeneration. We still look upon them uh, as uh, some sort of uh, uh, forces who are alien to forest regeneration. Now we passed a historic Forest Rights Act in 2006, which gives pattas uh, to traditional forest dwellers. You know, almost 13 lakh forest dwellers have been recognized for their rights. But the next step is to recognize them as partners in the regeneration of forests uh, has to be taken. And that requires uh, a complete mindset change. Uh, and I'm afraid 
uh, that mindset change has not really taken place across the country. Um, one or two places this has changed and it has made a huge difference. And I'll give you one example in Garchiroli district of Maharashtra, which is, you know, uh, one of the Maoist affected areas. Uh, in one of those villages in Garchiroli, uh, Mindaleka, the entire responsibility for bamboo trade, cultivation of bamboo, transportation of bamboo was transferred from the forest department to the tribal, to the Gram Sabha. And it made a huge difference, you know. So I think uh, the issue that you have raised on tribal India is very, very important because the discontent and the disconnect amongst the tribal communities is b really been one of the major factors behind the Maoist violence in large parts of central and eastern India. Yeah, I just had a question. You, know, you had talked about Isaiah Berlin's um, metaphor two years ago. Hello. Yeah. You talked about Isaiah Berlin's metaphor about the, the growth hedgehogs and the environmental hedgehogs. He's referring to the convocation address Jairam had delivered at the ACJ. That's right. right. Yes. Um, you know, I, I see your faith in growth remains unshakable. Uh, one of the things that I wanted, the question that I had is, the renewables might address the carbon-centered pollution that we're talking about, but then it still goes on to power an inherently unsustainable economy based on unsustainable consumption, as it stands now. So what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how does that change in the future? And the second, again, we have based our entire growth model, our entire model for prosperity or development on an economical mo on, on, on economy, a capitalist economy, which celebrates accumulation and competition. So how does that address the issue of inclusiveness? Thank you. Uh, but, you know, the desire for an improved standard of living is primeval in all of us. All of us want refrigerators, all of us want air conditioners, all of us want cars, all of us want to have, cons we all have consumption needs, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, the reason why we respect, adore, admire, and worship Gandhi is because we can't follow his example, you know. <laughs> You know, and really, I mean, are we, are we going to, I am not prepared uh, to say that we must have a strategy which means denial of consumption needs to large sections of population. That is politically suicidal. And apart from being politically suicidal, is it equitable? I mean, is it what, you know, uh, you know, the famous... There used to be a very famous civil servant called S. Bhutalingam, a very, very witty man. Old timers might remember S. Bhutalingam. So Bhutalingam once said, he wrote a review of some book on this debate on wage goods model versus capital goods model. So Bhutalingam wrote a review in which he said, you know, this debate is all bogus because wage goods are goods that economists would like wage earners to buy and they themselves would not buy. You know, so it's, are we going to deny consumption? In your model of economic growth, uh, consumption doesn't play a role. Unfortunately, everybody wants a better standard of living. You know, everybody wants electricity, everybody wants transport, everybody wants jobs, and that is going to come only from economic growth, my friend. <laughs> No, the nature of growth, if you argue, I'm willing to say yes. The nature of growth, what that growth should be. But to say that, you know, we must rethink growth, we must rethink consumption, that I don't think people will have patience for, frankly. And I said this at the ACJ convention, uh, convocation, I'll say it again, that as long as environmentalists deny the need for economic growth, you're not going to win this debate. You must start on the assumption that economic growth is essential. How do you make that economic growth more inclusive and more sustainable? That is your challenge. Not to say, I don't want economic growth. We can do without economic growth. All of us can go by bus. All of us can, you know, all of us can wear khadi. The fact of the matter is today, only the rich guys can wear khadi. I'm not rich, but you know. <laughs> But fact is that 
fact is that khadi and fab india is a, is a upper middle class consumption need yeah so i think we have to rethink some of this nitya and you know we are not going to win this debate if you are going to stick to this old line of let's get out of the economic model that we got within this economic model what are the choices that you can make and my view is that within this economic model you can make sensible choices which will lead to more sustainable growth yes please i'm lakshmi and i belong to the congress party um <laughs> so um So, yeah, uh, my question is about uh, the current... Is this current prearranged? No. <laughs> 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 uh, may, uh, <laughs> Please go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm still going to ask a question about the current government's attitude towards environment. So, while they are very happy uh, to take up issues like, you know, pub public defecation and um, open defecation and uh, you know uh, urban cleanliness and uh, you know general hygiene uh, but are they are they sold on the climate change theory um, are they are they living in denial um, when it comes to climate change i don't think you know i don't want to make this this government previous government because you know that's not the purpose here you know uh, and i can tell you there were enough people in the previous government who believed like the present government as far as environment is concerned you know so th there's no i think this is not a political issue it's not a political issue i think uh, it's issue of a certain ideology the prevailing ideology is one of as i said growth at all costs uh, that you must have growth at all costs and we'll worry about environment it's a cost to be borne i think we that that needs to be challenged that that really needs to be challenged and i think what bothers me is that uh, what bothers me is that there is somehow uh, the prevailing orthodoxy the prevailing orthodoxy today uh, is one of uh, disregard to environmental norms regulations laws and viewing them as a obstacle to faster economic growth and that's what bothers me the most and i hope that this is only a passing phase you know yes the gentleman there at the end yes yeah uh, i am dr murli biomedical engineer the, the most remain the burning problem india faces is the population increase we have we, we have 55000 babies born in every single day in india we are 2 crore population it's equal to the australian entire australian population in one year is it possible without reducing the population we can con reduce the global warming after indira gandhi nobody is bothered about talking about the family planning is it a political reason behind it no i told you our karma is another 400 million people <laughs> so even today if all states of india were to replicate tamil nadu and kerala all states of india and by the way uh, many states of india have come to replacement levels of fertility this is generally not known kerala tamil nadu andhra karnataka maharashtra punjab a couple of other states small states like himachal sikkim they have all reached replacement levels of fertility of 2.1 or below it's really up bihar madhya pradesh jharkhand odisha rajasthan where the replacement levels of fertility will take another 30 40 years so you can do what you want the, i mean all the youngsters here the students here can decide to remain single you know or childless we are still going to add 400 million people because that's the momentum that's the demographic momentum that's the base so india has to be prepared for 1.7 billion by the year 2050 when which 1.7 we would be world's most we would still be growing in 2050 by the way by 2050 population of kerala would start declining population of tamil nadu would also be stable and declining by about 2050 but there would be many states of india particularly in the north and the east where the population momentum would still be there and that is the most important reason why we need 
to do something on climate change differently. That is the most important reason why we need to be sustainable in our growth. You see, most countries may not have future generations. Japan's population will come down from 120 million to 100 million in the next 30 years. Germany's population is going to come down from 80 million to 60 million. Russia is going to come down from 140 or 130 to 110. And America's population and in UK's population is kept high. You know why? Because of immigration from the subcontinent. <laughs> Moment you choke off the immigration, their birth rates also will start to fall. So this is the next 30, 40 years, the growth in population is going to be in India. And secondly, unlike in China, where China's population has already begun to age, India's population is continue going to be young for the next 25 to 30 years. So if you're not careful about sustainability of economic growth, you will use up all your coal now, You'll, you'll destroy all your forests now. You will pollute all your air now. And the costs will have to be borne 30 years from now. And you will not be in a position to bear those costs. So the reason why this grow now, pay later model should not apply to India, fundamental reason is demographic. Because we are going to be adding 400 million people in the next 30 years, which is really a one generation. So you've got to think of a different way of growing. But grow you must. I'm afraid we have just one time for one last question. And um, Mr. Ram has uh, the, the, the privilege. And my apologies to all the others who did want to ask questions, because we've exceeded our time by about 15 minutes. I'm sure you could raise this with Mr. Jairam individually later on. Thank you. Till uh, you came along as minister, the clear impression we had, particularly in the editorial halls of the Hindu, they reflected in the editorials at that time, is that India ma made up, brought up the rear in the international debate and also the actions, whatever actions followed in that. And within your government, and particularly at the top, because I, we looked at the statements of, the, of uh, Manmohan, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh quite closely, uh, we were not willing to take the kind of position you have been articulating in international uh, the talks. Also, you yourself may have changed because uh, you faced some critics and you arrived at a new position, it seems. People like Jai Raman, who, was a, who seemed to be a fierce critic to start with, who, you, uh, who, who um, you engaged with and so on. Are you now moving into a new space now that the handcuffs being in government are off? Well, I'm certainly far more outspoken now than I was in government. I had certain constraints. <laughs> I had certain constraints when I was in government because I had to carry uh, everybody along. I had to carry, um, you know, the old timers along with me. You know, when I first articulated this uh, position, uh, some of the old time negotiators refused to join the negotiating team. You know about this; it created headlines then. Uh, and but I'm glad that things are changing. You know, India in 2014 is not the India of 2009, you know, and um, uh, parliament debates have taken place, uh, people have begun to recognize that India needs to be a little more pragmatic. Uh, but yes, I mean, I would certainly now be far more uh, open. But let me tell you, Mr. Ram, I still feel that the dominant view in India is that we shouldn't do anything on climate change. That this is not our headache. We have not caused this headache. This is somebody else's problem. Uh, the US uh, must do something about it. China must do something about it, if at all. But India, you know, we can, we have, you know, as this gentleman said, you know, we have poverty, we have underdevelopment, and we must, we must focus on that. The notion that India must be a leader, uh, which was what I was trying to propagate, that we must show to the world uh, a solution, rather than identifying the problem, uh, that um, uh, I have not yet seen enough evidence for uh, in the new scheme of things. Uh, but I do hope that, you know, uh, given the public debate that takes place here, given that our civil society uh, is so very active and very vibrant, 
I hope that you know we would be able to show a different position to the world because if we don't show the leadership there is no other country that is going to show the leadership frankly everybody else is going to be uh, waiting for the others to move and the question that each of us has to ask is is it wise and is it in India's interest to continue the status quo my argument is no my argument has been and this is the, what this evening has been all about that the costs of the status quo are the maximum for India. And therefore, it is in India's interest to break the status quo logjam. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's been a very interesting and diverse round. And uh, my apologies once again to those who could not raise the questions uh, that you had, for surely because of the tyranny of time. And now I request, uh, yes. Our speaker for the evening, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, uh, Mr. Sashi Kumar, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished audience, I thank you all for joining us this evening uh, on a very engaging and important uh, theme, climate change, and more importantly, how India and as individuals can contribute to this debate and take it forward as leaders, which was the crux of uh, Mr. Ramesh's lecture. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, I thank you very much, sir, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, for this informative lecture highlighting the challenges faced by India, the manner in which these should be addressed, particularly your positioning it as a public health issue and also one in which India should take the leadership role. Thank you very much again. I thank Mr. Sashi Kumar for moderating the evening, the lively interaction, and the Asian College of Journalism for hosting this evening's lecture. I thank the audience, friends from the media, young journalists, and of course the enthusiastic participants from the audience without whom this program would have been incomplete. Thank you very much and we look forward to meeting you again at future events.